you know, we can start um, talking about my topic of the day, which is how to trade flow, uh, something that uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter have seen me do a lot. I, I do this essentially every single day. It's my pri primary preferred way of trading. Um, and before, you know, we kind of discuss what is flow, or rather, you know what, um, let's discuss what is flow before we even start discussing the strategies that I use. Basically, my strategy is to trade intraday every single day. And the reason why I try to trade intraday is because those of you who are familiar with the FX market, I think can see that it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. The market is uh, moves so much uh, that, and guys, just hang on to your hang on to your uh, uh, questions for the time being, because I just want to get over like the basic setups of, of what I do, and then we can ask you can all ask me questions. Um, the market moves so much on a on a day to day basis, and news moves so much on a day to day basis that I find it very very hard to handicap long term. Like in other words, um, maybe you have a great idea that the, the euro uh, was going to go to 150 because ECB is going to raise, raise rates to 2.5% and, and the Fed is going to lag. But maybe the uh, European Union is going is to fracture and the euro is going to go to 120 in the same time frame. It, the point is that projecting long-term scenarios to me is very difficult because I can see the chances of either one of them happening with equal probability. Um, and I want to be trying to find opportunities on a where where the probability is greater than 50/50 in my in my advantage. So generally, what I try and do is trade very short-term news, trade the direction of whatever news is coming out. Now, je now, basically, news falls into sort of three categories. The the most common category that that everybody's familiar with is the economic news. That is the fixed economic data that everybody expects. And there's a whole bunch of you know, Kathy gives a very good uh, uh, webinar on what economic data is worthwhile taking a look at, what economic data is worth trading, and also um, uh, what economic data um, would be uh, uh, not worth trading in terms of, in terms of market moving um, uh, effect. That's just one thing. What everybody, I think, doesn't understand about flow is that that's just only one factor that moves the currency market. The other very important factor that moves the currency market is actually commentary, commentary from monetary officials. Something that's very obvious to um, to a lot of people, but not necessarily um, really uh, obvious to – just bear with me for a second here, guys. Um, something that I think is very – you know, it's, it's kind of obvious, uh, but uh, I don't think people appreciate it as much as they should, is that currencies are monetary assets. We're basically talking about money. So people who control money – Monetary officials have a huge impact uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, flow. That's why commentaries from Touche, commentaries from Bernanke, commentaries from Janet Yellen, commentaries from Smoggy, a lot of different commentary from a lot of different people will tend to exert um, price movements that a lot of times will, you know, will suddenly take a lot of people by surprise. You know, this is why I think I love about uh, technical analysis. Everybody will see a double top. It will look beautiful. Everybody's convinced that this it's a great short or, you know, uh, head and shoulders formation is a great short. And then somebody says something and boom, all of a sudden the whole setup is completely ripped to shreds. Which is why I tend to not look at um, chart patterns as anything but um, just, you know, descriptions of the past. And remember that we get paid on trading the future, not trading the past. So the third thing that moves currencies that is very important on a flow basis is these exogenous events. So uh, a downgrade by uh, by a uh, rating agency, which we saw a lot of it uh, last week, an earthquake, a natural disaster, anything that's unexpected, that is exogenous, that is external to the market, is going to have an impact. And sometimes it has the exact opposite impact uh, than, uh, than what we think. I mean, the first reaction to the Japanese earthquake was short yen. Then people began to realize, oh, this is actually going to be positive yen because of repatriation. And the complete twist of logic, people bought a currency of a country that just had a devastating economic uh, uh, impact whose GDP 
production, wealth, and everything else is very likely to disintegrate materially over the next six months uh, because of technical flows. And that is why, um, you know, this is, not a, this is not an easy game by any means of imagination. You have to be constantly thinking through your, your, your position, constantly trying to understand what it is that you're trying to, um, what it is that you're seeing in the market and what it is the market is likely to react to. And then furthermore, have the price confirm your suspicions, right? So this is one of the most critical things that, that I think is um, a lot of people miss when they, when they try to trade flow. Because I not only, uh, the charts are always telling the truth in the, in the past. Nobody's telling the truth in the future, right? I mean, that's what I love. A lot of people, they're always, they're always these great um, uh, bromides, these great platitudes. Charts tell the truth. Trade what you see. The price never lies. The price lies every single moment of the day. If the price is rising but the facts are, are falling, then you're buying a breakout and get stopped out, right? I mean, if price never lies, then everything, and everything we did with, that followed price would have made us, would make us money. Um, it's never that simple. I wish it was, but it's never that simple. Um, I do not swing trade. This is this is all strictly intraday trading. You know, so if you have an interest in swing trading, this is not the webinar for you. This is all for people who want to learn how to trade intraday. Um, so the basic setup of what I do. So this is now you understand the, the philosophy of what I do, which is try to trade flow and the and the key key um, news components that that comprise that flow which means that I have to monitor news events, I have to monitor economic calendars, I have to monitor uh, what, what people are saying, I have to monitor Twitter and all these things. It is not a strategy for the lazy or the uninvolved. It's the exact opposite. It's a strategy for people who want to get intensely involved in the, uh, in the currency market. My basic risk um, reward parameters Yes, it is like momentum technically, but you have to have a reason for momentum. That's the critical thing. I don't just trade momentum for momentum's sake. I try to figure out if momentum is legitimate or illegitimate. That's the critical thing. Um, so the basic setup that I have trades the uh, the currency market in, yeah, and everybody says you're oh oh one and 50, but we really chop it up really into quarters. Let me just show you what I mean. So... This is the euro dollar. I'm going to chop it up into first half dollar. So this is like, you know, this will make this 140. Let's imagine that's like 140. And this is 3,900, right? So this is, you know, the euro dollar chopped up into 50 cent intervals. And those of you who know, uh, know me, um, my, my preferred, preferred trade is either two to fifties or two to zeros, right? 20, uh, uh, if I'm going to the upside, it's 75 to the zero. If I'm going to the downside, it's 25 to the zero. And if I'm going to, um, to the upside, it's 25 to the 50. If I'm going to the downside, it's 75 to the 50, right? Yeah, the reason why, and I kind of want to make the distinction between two versus through. Two is when you're trading two to zero line or to the 50 line. Through is when you're buying the break of the OO or the 50 line. Now, both strategies work, but my preferred bias. I believe there's a higher probability in trading to the number than through the number. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I just want to make sure that everybody understands that what I mean. So I like to trade to the OO and to the 50 instead of through the OO and the 50. Now, that's really my own bias. I'm sure many of you um, may have a different experience and may think it's, you know, it's completely arbitrary what I do. But that's, I generally found through experience that it's a higher probability bet if I'm going to try to trade to the number than through the number. Right. My basic risk and reward parameter is I trade 20 up against 25 risk. So let's um, uh, let's just imagine a a trade of 39, 25 to the 50, right? To the 50, the trade that I did earlier today, those of you who, who were um, watching me on Twitter, I actually bought the 25s, but my exit is not 50. My exit is 45. So I am willing to risk 25 points to make 20 and hope that I'm at least 60% correct. Ideally, in a perfect world, I want to be correct 7 out of 10 times, but I'll take 6 out of 10, and in reality, you know, it's 6.5 out of 10. 
will give me a positive edge. Why do I use 20 versus 25? Because very often price will come within the um, uh, the OO number and not necessarily hit it. Like this is a perfect example. Today we we went all the way down to 3903, which would have been 05 offer, right? Would have made me would have made my T1. But if I had an OO uh, offer, if I tried to make 25 against 25, I wouldn't have made it. And my point is that I find it's better to sacrifice five extra points of risk in order to ensure that I'm going to have a higher probability of hitting my trade. So that's my basic risk and reward, uh, risk and reward parameters, right? Um, so what is my year pip value on trade? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Are you saying, like, how many pips do I make a year? Um, ask me in December 31st, 2011, I'll tell you. Um, Okay, the next very, very important component. So we've gone through what is it that I trade? How do I trade in terms of risk and reward? The very last and very, very important component is when do I trade? And this is something, by the way, that I got completely destroyed by today. I call today WHAM, whip around Monday, because I forgot a very – I didn't forget, but I, I, I just didn't – I. I was so uh, absorbed in everything else, I didn't quite realize uh, the change in daylight savings time. I trade what's called high probability hours. The high probability, high liquidity hours are, I'm going to do this, and this is on my, remember my clock is in East Coast time. I'm in New York time. So this is 3 o'clock in the morning New York time until basically noon New York time. Let's imagine this goes all the way out to noon, right? So, from 3 in the morning New York time, which is the London open equity market, and the noon New York time, which is the um, pretty much the end of London uh, evening session, and, you know, New York, New York kind of closes down. The reason why this is the best to trade is because this is when you have the most amount of um, traders involved in the market, and you have the greatest potential for continuation. You also have the biggest amount of news being released. You have the biggest amount of participants, and you have the greatest potential for price movement. Now, what I did today, which many of you saw, is I completely screwed up my times. Um, 3 o'clock today was actually not London Open. Today was the 4 in New York time. By New York time, it was 4 o'clock today. So I actually got stuffed on this particular trade, this, this, this breakout of 39.50. I got stuffed. I, I, um, I think I bought the 50, and I got, and I got stopped out on the breakout, right? I then waited until we, re, you know, we regained strength in the in the, uh, in the European Open. I got long the 25s and I made the 40 back to the upside. So I basically scratched out uh, the session today because I forgot about daylight same time. And this and this is, by the way, happens all the time. These are the kind of things that nobody ever thinks about when they trade. They always think that you know I'm just going to do everything perfectly. But you make a lot of stupid mistakes that have nothing to do with the market itself. I mean, the market is hard enough to trade, and sometimes you just make, you know, a lot of dumb mistakes like that. So it happens. The point being is, with a strategy like mine, where I'm using very, very small um, risk, and I'm using comparatively the same type of return, a mistake like this doesn't cost me much. I mean, I'm basically, you know, so I'm flat for the day. That's not, you know, perfect, but uh, it's better, it's better than, than losing, you know. And, um, um, you know, that's a mistake I'm certainly not going to make again for the rest of the next two weeks while we have the GMT time going on. But <clears throat> um, so there was one other point that I kind of wanted to make. Yeah, schoolboy error is exactly right. Exactly right, schoolboy error. There's one other point that I wanted to make. Um, oh, so the last thing that, that people always ask me for, so we talked about what I trade. We talked about the risk and reward of how I trade. We talked about when I trade, right? And now I think is, is, is something that you'll find very interesting and, and very surprising. Um, how much do I trade? Now, generally, you know, in the uh, currency market, we have up to 100 to 1, and now with, with the new uh, North American rules, we have 50 to 1 leverage, right? So a lot of people trade with very high leverage. Some people think that 10 to 1 leverage is incredibly conservative, right? You'll be shocked to know that I trade – the longer I trade, the less leverage I've traded. And I have gotten myself down now to trading two-to-one leverage. 
That means for every $10,000 in my account, I only trade $20,000 worth of currency. Obviously, <coughs> you have to have a large account to have a meaningful impact. But I'll give you I'll give you the flip side of it. My target size, um, what I in a perfect world, what I shoot for is one percent per week. So if you have a hundred thousand um, hundred thousand dollar account and you're making one percent per week, you are making um, fifty percent per year, which is tremendously good. So you're making fifty thousand on a hundred thousand. That is a very very uh, viable return. If you can make two percent per week, which is something that I strive for. Um, you're really golden. You're making a hundred thousand on a hundred thousand. Um, I just wanted to give you sort of a reference point because the reason why I think that's so important is I think everybody trades with much higher leverage than, than they, than they should. And even at 10 to 1 leverage, if you, um, lose 2%, you're down 20% on your account. If you lose 3%, you're down 30%. And remember, if I'm shooting for 1% or 2% per week, yeah, my leverage is 2 to 1. 2 to 1, basically. 2 to 1. So and if, I'm, if I'm basically using 1%, if I'm shooting for 1%, I'm actually making um, 100,000 on a, because I'm basically trading with 200,000. Right. What matters is consistency and not to blow your account on a bad streak. That's very true. But the point is, we're all going to hit bad streaks. And the only way that I have found to mitigate the bad streak is to lose no more than, um, you know, quarter, 25 basis points to 50 basis points per trade, you know? Um, I don't trade. I mean, the reason I, I, we have a five-minute chart here, it, it's really immaterial. Nathan, I could put a 50-minute chart. I trade price. I do not trade, um, I do not trade uh, time, you know? What I'm interested in is price. I don't care if the if my my sometimes my trades take ten minutes, sometimes they can take as long as three hours. You know, I couldn't care less. As long as I'm in a viable trade that meets my that meets my criteria, that is, you know, I have a news event that I think is positive, it moves through my levels, and I'm going to target my other levels. Then I have a then I'm staying in the trade. You know, um, until I either make it or uh, or you know it, it stops me out. Um, the other thing is I make a lot of, remember that because I'm really, I'm, I'm trading intraday, I'm trading at least five, six, seven times a day. Um, you know, because price is going to move through these quarter, quarter levels at least four or five times, you know, during the day. And some, and because, you know, and the questions that you always have is, okay, legitimate breakout, illegitimate breakout. For example, this 3975, uh, I actually thought this was a legitimate breakout over here, you know, but we took it out. And I got long, and now you know. Now I may be able, I, I may be stuffed out on on, on the 3950 because the reason why I kind of like this long position was uh, because we took out the uh, day's high. The market feels very strongly that the ECB is going to raise rates. You know, they came off positive Friday EFSF announcement. Uh, we also had uh, the pound, which is something I've been trading much more successfully. I actually, by the way, people ask me, what have I been trading uh, as far as currency pairs? I only trade the euro and the pound. Uh, first of all, I don't have, uh, they're the two of the most liquid per currency pairs. Secondly, they're the ones that have the most news, news flow on them. And thirdly, I just don't think, I think when you're trading, um, you know, so intensely, you, you have to specialize. You have to specialize. You cannot, you know, you cannot be a jack of all trades um, and trade every single thing. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why, by the way, I also hate trading the yen because I think the yen is just a very, very difficult pair to trade. Um, so let's take a look at the pound. The pound, for example, today was a, a very, you know, very easy trade. One of, the, one, one of the nice trades today in the pound was, so it took out the 25, and here was the, here was the move to 50. And the reason why you had the good move to 50 was because the standard of poor's reaffirmed the AAA rating of UK. It's positive for UK. And it's, I still think it's a positive move here in 25. If we have any kind of a risk supportive atmosphere into the North American, uh, you know, trade, then it, then a move to, towards 6150 is quite likely. So that's how I sort of analyze it. Now, am I, am I right or wrong? I'm, I'm wrong quite a lot of times, obviously. You know, obviously different things happen. In a perfect world, 
What you really want is a really strong piece of news, a move through these levels, and then, you know, a target towards the other levels, and the trade really takes like, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times it doesn't, you know, it doesn't quite happen. The critical thing that you don't, you don't want to do is simply buy just because you're buying or sell just be, uh, buy because you think it's too high or sell because you think it's too low. It's never too high. It's never too low if you understand the reason. The, key to, the critical thing here is understand the story and you understand the trade. The hard part is understanding the story. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what really uh, requires you to constantly pay attention. Um, let me be, before I get to the news sources, let me just backtrack. There was a couple of uh, other questions I didn't address. <clears throat> so somebody, uh, uh, Golfie is asking, what I think about risking 2.5% risk per capital? A lot. That's a lot, my friend. Ten trades in a row negative at 25%. Ten trades in a row negative. Very, very possible in this business. So, you know, my risk is no more than half a percent. Um, do I still trade the session high, session low? Uh, great question. I, I, I don't trade that in, in, in its, you know, in a sense of like, oh, we broke the session high, I'm going to buy it. But I look at it very carefully within the context of the news. If the news is positive, we took out session highs, I, 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 that, that all confirms my view that, yeah, if I'm within the level of my quarters, I want to take my quarters, you know, and go. So, in that sense, yes. So, like, um, let's go back. I mean, obviously, you know, session highs here in the pounds. The session, new session highs made here um, on the 25s were a great, were a great uh, trade to the 50s, right, or to the 45s. You see that? Um, so, I will look at that very much within the context, within the context of my of my quarter trading. That's absolutely right. Um, somebody, uh, Goldie's asked me that I mentioned that I use time-based stops. I don't use time-based stops. Um, I use um, I use uh, price-based stops. I'm you know I'm risking 25 points per trade. It either works for me or it doesn't work for me. What I will occasionally do is if I see the price action, let's say go 17, 18 points in my favor, right, and then not really move any further, stall, right. I will very often just take take the trade. In other words, I won't go to my full target because if the price isn't moving in my direction, if it, it's moved partially in my direction but hasn't moved fully in my direction, I believe the better risk reward is to take, you know, half a loaf and run than to try to risk um, uh, the full stop out the other way. And I wrote and I wrote a whole column about that, which you can read in FX Street called Asymmetrical Risk. It's this week's column. I recommend if you guys haven't read it um, that you give it a try. Um, so um, now is a good uh, 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 25 points is how much value that all depends uh, JP on on the value of your um, uh, of your account which is what I'm saying to you it's 25 points is what I'm risking but it could be um, 100,000 units it could be 50,000 units it could be 5,000 units it could be half a million units it all depends on the size of your account and how, how much you want to leverage um, I don't use um, uh, I don't use Renko charts. No, again, guys, remember my my view of, of of charting and price action is very simple. Charts are just reflection of price. You don't need to get complicated. This is not co the business itself is not very complicated. Price is either going to go up or it's going to go down or it's going to stay the same, right? So the, the 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 art of the game is figuring out what's the higher probability and why do you think that, that it might go up or might it go down. So my source of my news which is a question that a lot of people are asking right now, um, is really threefold. Number one, first of all, I, I uh, have CNBC Global, that is CNBC Asia, Europe, and U.S. that I subscribe to, and I have it on the web. And that's very good just for broad, general market releases. You know, like uh, what's the big story of the day? What's the market really focusing on? Um, does this story have uh, legs? Does it have continuation? Is, is it, you know, is it meritorious to uh, to want to join the story? Thank you, administrator, for uh, for uh, uh, linking to my uh, to my story here. Um, so CNBC News is what I watch as, as as my as my background noise on uh, on my computer. I read the Dow Jones Newswire from DealBook 360 at GFT which if you're a customer of GFT, if you're a gold customer of GFT or, or like a silver account, you get that for free. It's a very, very nice um, 
not necessarily, it does have really good real time uh, information, but really it's much more of an analytical feed. They have a lot of guys ch chiming in every single hour on the various, um, they're talking to a lot of dealing desks all across the day and they're getting a lot of feedback from dealing desks. So you get a tone and a sense of what the market is, um, is, is using. Um, I, my Twitter feed, if you guys want to look at who I follow on Twitter, you will get some very good ideas of where I get a lot of my information from. Um, because I, you know, I find Twitter obviously both, I'm both a producer and a user of Twitter in a big way. Um, and, um, you know, and lastly, you know, for, for just basic economic, um, information, you can always look at FX Street Calendar just because they have real time calendar and it's very good in terms of, um, in terms of giving you just the instantaneous economic information that's going to be coming out. But I, you know what? I think the other thing that you need to understand, and this is, this is, uh, I think important for me to describe because a lot of people ask me this. You know, we talk about risk on, risk off. You know, risk trade, not risk trade. What does it mean? What is, you know, what is this, uh, why is it important? The reason why currencies are bought for the most part is because their interest rate is going to go up. The reason why they're sold is because the interest rate is not going to go up, it's going to go down, or the country's credit will be marked lower. It will no longer be a great credit. Currencies really are credit instruments. And I think you have to, what I analyze every single day, you have to analyze the whole currency market from the prism of interest rates. If you begin to look at everything from an interest rate point of view, a lot of things will make sense to you. A lot of things will make sense to you. You will, you will understand why the euro is being bought right now, even though there's all this kind of crap going on with the sovereign debt problems and, and you know, Portugal and Greece and everything else. You understand why the dollar is not being bought. Why nobody wants to own the dollar really, you know, for any, for any legitimate period of time. And, uh, you understand why those same currencies get sold when you have credit risk problems. So what's happening to the yen? Why is the yen being bought? Yen is like one of the most difficult currencies to sort of analyze because clearly it does not have any legitimate interest rate, right? And yet it is so wanted. It is, it is in such high desire. And the reason why is because, um, it's really twofold. The Japanese own a lot of foreign assets. They own a huge amount of other people's financial assets. And the reason why the yen is rallying right now is because there's a huge fear in the market that the Japanese, in order to, in order to create wealth, they, they've lost a huge amount of wealth. Think about it this way. The earthquake was, um, um, yeah, uh, Coco, I'll ask you, I'll answer that question in a second. The earthquake was an event that destroyed a huge amount of wealth. So in order to regain some of your wealth, you have to sell assets. Assets that you have are primarily in U.S. treasuries, in European bonds, and everything else that's not in your own currency. The act of selling other people's assets technically, technically is bullish the yen because what you're doing is you're selling dollars and getting, bringing the yen back in. You're buying yen. So the yen rallies not because of any fundamental reasons, but because of technical reasons. That's the primary reason for why for why it comes up. Um, Jeff, I don't I don't understand what uh, what you mean. Um, are you asking me like you know am I going to be able to trade live with you guys? No, I'm gonna, no, I'm not going to be able to trade live. Uh, yes, and insurance companies have to buy yen in order to cover losses and all of those things, but that's only one side of the story, right? The other side of the story, if you think about this, is, okay, maybe they, you know, maybe they have to sell all those things, but maybe they don't, they don't necessarily want to sell all those things because they know that at the moment they start selling their assets, they're going to lose money. The treasury bills are going to go down. In, in other words, if you're a forced seller, you know, if you're a forced seller, you're always going to sell it at a bad price. So maybe what the Japanese really want to do is actually uh, issue as much yen as possible, have the Bank of Japan issue as much debt as possible, monetize it, and pay for all of their reconstruction, not by selling their assets, but by actually issuing more and more debt. And if they issue more and more debt, that's actually yen negative because that means they're going to they're put more yen 
uh, supply into the marketplace, and that could actually uh, drive dollar yen higher. So depending on how things play out, the trade could go either way, and that's why it's so important to always understand, you know, the dynamics of, of, of what's happening on, on a broader scale. The truth of the matter is nobody can really tell what is going to happen, which is why trading yen, I think, is a sucker's bet. It's very, very tough to have any legitimate conviction that, yeah, this is going to happen this way, this is not going to happen the other way. It's much easier when Jean-Claude Trichet says, I'm going to raise rates, to get long euro dollar, right? I mean, that was a layup of a trade from 38, 36, 37. That was a layup of a trade. The guy says, I'm going to raise rates. That's going to be very, very bullish. It's very easy to get long um, the pound when three out of six guys go out and say they want to raise rates on, on the MPC meeting, suggesting that um, the rates in the U.K. are going to go up, Right. It's pretty easy to get long pound when inflation numbers come out really, really hot, forcing the BOE to consider raising rates. Similarly, it's pretty easy to get short pound if all of those dynamics reverse themselves, right? Right. Um, somebody wants to know, like, you know, if I have any examples of earlier in the day. Um, you know what? I, I will post those on my Twitter feed. The reason I, I don't want to do this right now is because we're running out of time. And it's going to take me a long time to launch my software and get everything organized. So um, I will post, I, I, as I always do at the end of the day, I'll post all, all my trades. And, uh, um, uh, you know, we, uh, you, you guys can take a look at it there. I'll tell you that right now I'm long cable from about from a bad price. And, again, this, is, this is goes to do as I say, not as I do. I should have been long cable at 25. I'm long cable at around 30. I'm trying to see if I can make it up to about um, – 40, 45 on cable, China, trying to put a second run towards the 61.50. That's my, you know, that's one of my positions right now. Um, uh, Alan, I, I don't care what chart. I use a five to ten minute chart. I, I, I don't look at the I honestly don't look at the time. The five minute chart is just there for convenience. I look at price. You know, I, the only time that matters to me, this is, okay, this is, this is what you should all really focus on. The only time that matters to me is this, this time. The only chart that matters to me is the 3 to, to, to noon time chart, right? It does not matter to me. Oh, by the way, you know, hang on a second. I'm just going to – I'm going to blow out of this uh, – I'm taking my pound trade right now. Uh, okay. I took a little bit of profit. I took my, I took my profits here over here at, at, at uh, 45 on a pound, even though I told you I was – I did it very badly. I, I entered at 30 because, because you know, part of the reason is because I was um, not – I was getting ready for the uh, – uh, for the webinar, and I didn't really, you know, properly trade this, but I should have been buying this at 25, but at 30, I wanted to give it up at 45, and I gave it up around here at, at the pound, okay? Um, uh, yeah, you, Harley, you know, 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, right now, you have to, you know what, I'm so, I'm, you're absolutely right. Again, I, my mistake because of daylight savings time, I, I, it, it's, it's 3 to, to noon on a regular time, and now it's 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, in the next two weeks, right? So I'm, I'm really sorry for confusing everybody. It's 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. right now, um, and it's funny, you know, it's funny, Harley, that you said to me, to me, because I'm like, you know what? It's like almost the end of the session. How come the pound is so active when I realize it's not actually the end of the session? We've got, we got another extra hour of trading in, in London. So... Um, you know, my apologies. I, I am the world's worst, um, you know, daylight savings time person. So I, I kind of screwed that up. Um, yeah, anyways. Uh, is borrowing yen in a risk appetite environment translated into buying and selling yen? If you're borrowing in yen, that means you're selling yen. If you're using, if you're using yen to, fi to finance other uh, uh, trades, so if you're long gold, short yen, that means you're financing in yen, so it's negative yen. Um, that's a great idea. I don't use pivots, you know, Gavi, but, you know, give it a try. See if, uh, see if that works. Um, I don't use tick charts. Okay, let me just say it again. I don't care about charts. I don't care about this time that matters to me. The only time that matters to me, look at this. You see this? You see, this? You see how this thing is blowing up? Why is it blowing up? Because this is the high liquidity time. The only time that matters to me is the time of the chart. Not the time that's on the top of the chart, right? You see how the pound blew up here? I should have held this trade more. 
Now, why did the pound blow up? What did we talk about today? We talked about the fact that we had AAA rating reaffirmation um, <laughs> of the 168.1% of people. Uh, we had the reaffirmation from uh, from the S&P of a AAA rating. That's bullish, bullish, bullish pound, bullish credit, right? That's why I've been bullish pound day long, and that's why the grade, you know, the proper trade was was 25 to 50, which I gave up too early. Again, going into the uh, do as I say, not as I do category, I gave it up a little too early. I answered a little too late, but you know what? It's still, it's, it's it's still money, right? It's better money than it's better to be right than to be wrong, right? It's better to be skinny than to be fat. It's better to be strong than to be weak. So we try to be all of those degrees to a certain extent, right? Yes, I made some lunch money. That's exactly right. Okay. All right. Um, but, you know, my point again is if there's anything I, I can teach you here is to stop looking at this time frame and start looking at this time frame. This is when all the action happens, you know. It's like going to a club at 9 p.m. in the evening. What kind of a loser do you have to be, right? You're never gonna find you're never gonna find a good crowd at 9 p.m. in the evening. You know you gotta show up at a club, especially if you're in Barcelona. You have to show up at a club at like 2 a.m. before the action even starts out. Well, similar kind of thing in the FX market. You know, you gotta you want to make sure that you're at the club, not at the loser hour. Um, and so this this time frame doesn't matter at all. In other words, you can have a whole bunch of stuff happening on a five minute chart at this time frame that's completely uh, uh, you know <laughs> immaterial but uh, on a 15 minute chart or an hour chart or a micro chart or a tick chart or a Fibonacci chart or a Renko chart or anything else you're going to have a lot of action happening here and that's what I'm trying to teach you people is that it's not about charts charts express behavior it's about understanding behavior and behavior is driven by economic data monetary pronouncements, exogenous events, and the equity market participations, basically the, the activity of all investors during the business hours of when things are happening in the two primary um, um, markets of the world, which is London and New York, right? And it's not even London and New York. I mean, it's, not, it's London and New York is where the markets are, but it's everybody else who trades through those markets. I mean, Middle East trades through London, right? Um, Everybody in New York, all the Pacific Coast in, in America trades through New York. It's just, you know, that's they're just basically abstract points on a map where things happen during these hours. Now, I'll also just sort of, just to play more games with you, people are going to ask me, do I ever trade Asia? And the answer is, yeah, I will occasionally trade Asia. And the, and the way I'll trade Asia is if I have a very strong conviction that there is something that happened in New York, that is majorly market moving. And I think that when the Asian traders come online, when Japan comes online, when Hong Kong comes online, uh, investors are, gonna, are going to continue to react to this particular piece of news. I will occasionally take a flyer and do a continuation trade. In other words, if I think um, that, that the, there's more downside to the euro or more upside to the euro, I'll buy the 30, I'll, I'll sell 39.50 or I'll buy the 40. I'll have the uh, offers or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, limits out there and go to sleep and wake up and see if I was correct on my Asia trades. But I don't do it. I do it maybe once every 10 days. So uh, most, of my, most of my day, I trade uh, New, York. New York. And really, the, 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 the bread of the butter, the real meat and potatoes profitability happens here, right here. Oh, um, I'll trade. I'll trade actually both the pound and the euro. Coco, great question. What I will do is, and it's a great question. Remember what I said. I look at economic events, monetary pronouncements, and exogenous events, right? So today we didn't have anything really uh, as far as the euro goes. I mean, right now, you know, I, I, I'm fooling around with the euro, but the euro is just just walk, you know, basically walking me by its nose, right? But we did actually have actual meaningful news out of the out of UK. S and P reaffirm its AAA rating. That is a piece of news that, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A current. You know, it's just, it's just very, very fresh. So that's meaningful enough. And I want to, if the price confirms my view that, it, that this is a long, I want to participate. That's why I was, I was, I'm, I'm doing much, today I'm doing much better in the pound than I'm doing in the euro. The euro, I'm barely breaking even and it's leading me by its nose. In the pound, 
I basically made mo I made money in every single trade I made today. My trading plan says don't lose money. That's all it says. If you can just follow that one rule, everything else will fall in place. Unfortunately, I don't get to be that uh, uh, that effective in it sometimes. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, I'm being facetious, but I, I think you guys, uh, we've sort of reviewed um, what I do. Low leverage, small uh, small risk, uh, don't let any single trade uh, get, get out of control, and uh, lots and lots of different, you know, look for lots and lots of different trades throughout the day. Um, the idea here is uh, when the dust settles, you've made 1%. And if you're super great, you made 2% on your money at the end of the week. It's all about having realistic expectations of what you can, uh, you can try and do. The whole, here, the whole game here is not to be in this game for a week or a month or three months or uh, a year. The, the point of this game is to be in this game for, for five, ten years to enjoy yourself. And the only way to do that is by using very low leverage, very small risk, and constantly being aware of what's going on. Or at least that is for me. You know, for other people, they trade completely differently. But for me, I want to be in the game all the time, but I want to be in the game small so that, see, you have 1,800% in one and a half months. That's great, Golfie. I, I commend you. Now, if you can do that for another 10 months, you'll be doing great. Unfortunately, the probability of, of life says that's going to be very difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, maintain. You know, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the really hard part. Uh, currencies rating, oh, well, the currency rating is not, is, it, 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 they're basically issued by S&P, Moody's, and Fitch's. There are three rating agencies. And the news hits the, uh, CNBC, hits Dow Jones, hits the wires all the time. Um, what I recommend is that you guys, everybody who doesn't follow me, follow me on Twitter and also Look who I follow. Look at the people who I follow. There are a couple of pure news feeds that are very valuable that I follow. If you really want to, you can pay money for a real-time news service, and there are some that are relatively cheap, maybe less than 50 bucks a month, uh, that will help you, um, uh, that, you know, that, that, that will help you monitor a lot of this flow. Remember, news is not enough. You have to have news, you have to interpret that news as meaningful, and then you have to have the price confirmed that that news is meaningful by moving in the direction of the news. Yes, my trades are, are, are all single entry, single exit. I don't, you know, I, 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 I again, my whole idea is, is to be in, out, in, out, in, out. At the end of the day, um, try to make 25 basis points. If I have a great day, I make 50 basis points, you know. So, and look at, look at the pound, uh, you know, flying, flying. So if you learn nothing, you saw today that understanding fundamentals and understanding, you know, how to trade in quarters does actually work, right? I mean, we took the 25s to the 50. Probably, you know, we could have even taken it now. I mean, the pound is really soaring. Would I take the 75 to, uh, to the 00? That's a tough trade. The only reason I wouldn't take it is because you have so much extension already. The pound is extended so much. And um, unless I have other ideas on the pound, you know, if I have another another uh, fundamental reason why I want to get along the pound, this may be a very very tough trade. But you know, tough trade to take to uh, from 75 to um, to oh, oh, just because of extension. I try to. The other thing I try and do when you when you sort of trade this for a long time is try to take the first 25 or maybe the first 50 points of the move instead of trying to extend yourself too far. I don't trail stops because um, you know my stops are so so tight. They're 25 points tight. Um, you could. I mean, you know. Again, everything I do, I, I highly recommend you don't. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I highly recommend you guys experiment your own way. What I just wanted to show you was the, the overall structure of how I trade flow. And for those of you who follow me on, on Twitter, you can, you know, you can see me do this real time all day long, right? And, uh, and, you know, and I post my charts every single day so you guys can see the, uh, uh, what is it? The good, the bad, and the ugly. So you see, by the way, how at the end of London, they're really driving risk now. Yeah, trend, trend to me is things going up today. You know, the way I look at trend is, I mean, obviously, you know, I know the long-term trend. I know the long-term stories. Like right now, the long-term trend is positive euro. 
So on any given day, if you have positive euro information, you know, positive euro information, the probability is you want to trade euro to the upside. So yes, I, I, in other words, do I look at longer term trends? Yes, I'm aware of it. But trend to me is what's happening today. If right now Moody's came out and said, um, Greece is going bankrupt, Portugal is going bankrupt, Irish, Ireland is, 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 is gonna, is gonna dive out of the eurozone. Believe me, I'm not gonna say, oh, the euro's in a long term uptrend. I think I'm gonna be buying the dips. I'm going to be selling the thing with my eyes closed. I verify two and a half leverage too low. No, I, 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 my leverage is two and a half to one, two to one. That's not too low. That's what I consider to be, to be, uh, proper for me. My argument to you guys is that, is that everybody else's leverage is too high. Oh, um, my Twitter account is at FX flow. Follow me there. Okay, guys. How do I define intraday trend changes? Great question. Um, the best way to define intraday changes, Anthony actually asked a great question. But we'll finish with that question. Is the break of the day's high, day's low, right? If we get, you know, we make like for example, let me be this way. Right now, if the if the pound breaks uh, the sixty ninety level over here, that's going to be a trend change, my friend. That means something bad happened. Uh, within, you know, within the next 15, 20 minutes that just caused this thing to collapse completely, I'm going to respect the, you know, that this is a no longer an uptrend, right? So I look at highs, lows for the day as my, as my reference points of how I determine trends. Oh, it, uh, you know what? Uh, Golfy, it makes absolutely no difference. You're absolutely right. It's just that I, um, um, Percent of capital and leverage are sort of the same concept if you average everything out. It's just that I'm afraid that what most people do, is, I, when people ask me, like, how do I trade? I trade 200,000 units for 100,000 of my accounts, you know? It's just that, that that's, that's, what I, that's what I want people to understand. I, don't, I want people to understand that uh, I'm not trading 2 million against 100,000 um, in my account on, every, on any one of these trades, uh, even though I have small stops because I consider it to be over leveraged. Again, my, only my, you know, my opinion. You guys can certainly dismiss it. Anyways, we have definitely run out of our time as always. Uh, we, we will have this, um, uh, we will have this webinar on, um, uh, on recording as always, right? DK4XAdvisors.com, advisors.com. Um, come visit us over there. Um, I hope you guys uh, had a little bit of food for thought. Come visit me on, at, on Twitter. I tweet close to 15 hours every single day, and I hope you guys find it interesting. And uh, always, please, you know, write me back on Twitter. Everybody knows that I always respond to anything you guys write me on Twitter. If you have ideas, if you have anything else, just don't ask me what the ADX is, what the Bollinger Band is, what the moving average is, what the pivot is, what the Fibonacci is. I could not give a flying F. Um, I care about flow. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, I'm wishing you guys the best of luck. And uh, we'll see you guys, uh, we'll see you guys uh, in a month. That'd be great. Thanks a lot. Thank you for attending so much. Look at the pound fly, baby. Triple run. Wow. Even my euro, even my miserable euro trade is working. So I'm going out on a, on a winner. I'm taking my euro, euro out right now and, uh, I'm wishing you guys, uh, the best of luck. See you later, guys.